Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Um, now, I don't know whether you've had plenty of time to prepare to get here or you've rushed out the door or you've been caring for somebody else and they've made you late and whatever, or you've had all morning to kind of get here early and be really prepared. But it's great that we're all here and we're able to welcome each other and that we're welcomed here in God's presence. And it's great to see you all. And I'm sure there'll be more people join us as we go on. Um, but uh, let's just uh, let's just open in prayer before we start this morning. Lord, we just thank you for bringing us here together, that you have a purpose for each one of us, and your purpose for this morning is that we're here to worship you. Lord, we just pray that you would speak to each one of us, that you would meet with each one of us, and show a new part of you to each one of us today. We pray that through our worship and our reading and our prayers, and through Richard's talk this morning, that you would speak to us and you would be worshipped. So, Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. If you're able, let's uh, stand as we begin our worship this morning. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He! And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. We stand and lift up our hands. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord. God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. It's rising up. It's rising up all around. The anthem of the Lord's renown. It's rising up all around. It's the anthem of the Lord's renown, and together we sing, everyone sing, holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth is filled with His glory, holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth, the earth is filled with His glory. Amen. Please take your seats. And Lily is going to come and bring us our reading this morning. Thanks, Lee. 
Is it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. Today's reading is from John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. Or 1 to 19. Um, the next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, Praise God! Blessings on the one. <laughs> <laughs> I had the one wrong printed. Um, so it's John chapter 12, verses 1 to 19. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did, in, she did this in preparation for my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decides, decided to kill Lazarus too, for it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. The next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Amen. Thanks, Lily. As Mary had brought her extravagant worship at Jesus' feet and preparing for his burial, let's join together in worship if we're able to. Let's stand together and continue in our worship this morning.
faithful one, so unchanging. Ageless one, you're my rock of peace, Lord of all, I depend on you. I could ask you again and again. I could ask you again and again. You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up. When I fall down, all through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. You are my rock. You are my rock in time. Of trouble, you lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. My hope is in you. My hope is in you alone. Our hope. Our hope is in you alone. We bow down. And confess, you are Lord. In this place, we bow down and confess, you are Lord. In this place you are all I need it's your face I see in the presence of your love we bow down, we bow down, we bow down, and confess, you are Lord, in this place, we bow
Please be seated. James is going to come and lead us in our prayers. Thank you, James. Good morning, everyone. Please may we bow our heads and, and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your plan and purpose for each one of us here today. We pray that we will be obedient, follow your plan, and fulfill your purpose in our lives. Thank you for this fellowship, this fellowship of believers in you. We pray for togetherness, one mind, one purpose, to serve you, our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask to be joined together with love, and guided by your Holy Spirit. Dear Lord, help us to understand what it means to be part of your family, not just in this short life, but for the rest of eternity. We pray for the understanding of your word, your grace and wisdom. Teach us how these things are at work in our lives. Encourage us to share the offer of salvation, the gift of eternal life through Christ Jesus. Please open our eyes to your light and our hearts to your truth. We pray for ears that can hear and, mind, and minds that can interpret your precious words. We pray for your message spoken through Richard today. May it have real and true meaning in our lives. We pray for understanding, clear thoughts and positive influence. Help in becoming more like Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for your suffering before and after death, paying for the consequences of our sins. Thank you for your innocent blood, which sealed an everlasting covenant between us and God. All things are possible through you, Lord Jesus, our mighty King, our counselor, our closest friend. We pray for, courage, for your courage and strength, Help us stand together with faith and hope until that day we meet you in the clouds. Please bless us with humble hearts. Remove all pride and replace, with, and replace it with unconditional love. Work through us, sowing seeds of truth with every single person that we meet. We pray for this family, your family, your church to grow, saving souls and joining together in love for the rest of eternity. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, James. Let's continue in the attitude of prayer. Let's stand together if you're able. As we sing together, speak, O Lord, as we come to you. Speak, O oh Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us. In your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O oh Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Take 
teach us, Lord, full obedience, holy reverence, true humility. Sense our thoughts and our attitudes in the radiance of your purity cause our faith to rise cause our eyes to see your majestic love and authority words of power that can never fail let their truth prevail over unbelief. Speak, O oh Lord, and renew our minds. Help us grasp the heights of your plans for us. Truth unchanged from the dawn of time that will echo down through eternity. And by grace we'll stand on your promises, and by faith we'll walk as you walk. Speak, O oh Lord, till your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. Amen. Oh, Please be seated. Richard comes and brings us the word this morning. Thank you, Richard. You hear me okay? Who's ridden a donkey down at uh, Western Supermare on the beach before? <laughs> Can anyone remember the name of the donkey? Banjo. Banjo. Any others? Rocky. Yeah, my, my, um, my aunt used to live, Auntie Amelia, where did she live? Because we used to go past Churchill, out that way. And we used to go past a place where, is it Annabelle? The donkey? There was a book series on Annabelle. Um, when I was a child, and apparently that was the donkey, or at least that's what my, my mum and dad told me uh, about the donkey. <laughs> was it true? It was true. Okay, yeah. So I, I knew a famous donkey from a distance. Um, I quite like horse riding. I've only done it twice, but uh, the first time I went really well. And then the second time I was up in, um, in the Lake District, and uh, I was with some work colleagues on a team building exercise, and I was given a form because we were all going to go horse riding. And on this form it said... Uh, how confident are you around horses on a scale of one to 10? So I thought, 10. So I ticked 10. <laughs> and then it said, have you, have you ridden before? I said, yes. <laughs> and I went through. The, and then the questions got kind of away from the horses. And uh, I didn't know what I was going to be served up. And I remember my colleagues all getting their, their ponies, about 14, 15 hands. They all got on theirs. And then mine came out. <laughs> I reckon it was 19 hands. It was huge. And I felt the bee's knees. And I remember <laughs> climbing up the steps to get on this big stallion, big black stallion that was just head and shoulders above everything. And I felt magnificent. <laughs> this scene that we've read about, and I don't think, I don't know if Lily is still here, but she, she forgot to read my mind that I actually wanted a longer Bible reading. That's why I slipped that piece of paper in front of her, but she read it beautifully well. And I thought if Lily's reading, I want to take advantage 
of her and have as much of her reading as possible. So we, we bolted on an extra 12 verses, but thank you, to, thank you to Lily for doing that. But the scene that she read about, the main part, <clears throat> is often described as the triumphal entry. But this morning, I think I'd like to approach it, this particular subject in a particular way and to consider the detail of what's going on and some misconceptions that were being revealed and evidently were there given what was to happen about five days later when the people would betray Jesus. Many of them had an, a false concept of who Jesus was, what he was there to do, his mission, his identity. And there are the same misconceptions about Jesus even today. People have a false impression of who he is. And this was Passover time. We read that news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. Now, the historian Josephus estimated that there were well over two million, some would say at least two and a half million people who would have attended the Passover feast. Over a quarter of a million lambs were sacrificed each one enough to feed at least 10 people. That's a lot of lamb. I had a lamb kebab for dinner last night. It wasn't one-tenth of a lamb, I can assure you. It's a lot of lamb. I was thinking, where's Hamish? He would be, uh, he would be salivating at this subject. And people came from all over Israel and from other surrounding countries, including foreign converts, to Judaism. This was a big deal. Now, I don't know what the largest crowd you've been in is like in terms of thousands, perhaps. I think the biggest one I've been in was at Wembley Stadium. I watched Scotland play Wales rugby. This is when the Principality Stadium was being developed in Cardiff. So Wales had to play their, their away games. I could never get a ticket to see England anyway. So I thought, well, I'll go and watch Scotland against Wales. So there are 80,000 people there. <clears throat> The atmosphere is phenomenal. Has anyone been in a big crowd like that? You can sense it, isn't it? It's, uh, it's highly charged. And you can hear sometimes a, a crowd roar, and it kind of infects people. And it takes a life of its own. It's electric. It can even be a bit scary. And when the masses move, I remember going into Wembley Stadium, you're, you're kind of taking along with the bustle. You're moving partly involuntarily because you can't go the opposite direction because there are just thousands of people heading in a particular direction. And as we've seen, some people can get carried away at events like this. Moods can shift pretty quickly. I, I prefer rugby in terms of the crowds because they seem to be a bit more civilized than the football crowds. So I, I haven't been to see England play football, but I am on Tuesday. I'm gonna go and see them play Belgium. Hopefully it will be without event except for some goals, perhaps. But you do get things such as mass hysteria, contagious emotion. People can get whipped up quite easily. I thought I'd look that up. I'd looked up mass hysteria on Wikipedia, and I thought I'd just give you an example of just one example of what can happen. Wikipedia says, according to an account which was written by an author in 1784, a nun who lived in a German convent in the 15th century began to bite her companions. And the behavior soon spread through other convents in Germany, Holland, and Italy. People can be quite ridiculous sometimes. You think, how on earth did that happen? Effectively, there was a bit of a mass hysteria around certain behaviors. And you've seen this in perhaps a football hooliganism. I've seen that before, where something peaceful has become violent. And I was going to ask Richard Wormsley if he was here, how he would feel looking to control two and a half million people if you were in the police or trying to, uh, if you're in authority at that particular time. I don't think I'd fancy it. And so you had very enthusiastic people and they used to go to Jerusalem every year. And they were enthusiastic, excitable, highly charged, but for many, their enthusiasm that was directed at Jesus was 
misguided. And there would have been a, a huge cross-section of people at this event, all the sorts of people you can possibly think of. There would have been nationalists, religious fundamentalists, messiah seekers, pious religious, truly religious, onlookers, party people, strong-willed, weak-willed, neutrals, even Man United fans. And this is what happens. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. But what many of them thought that they were seeing and what the reality was, was very different. And we can tell because we know the end of the story. We know how it pans out over the course of the next few days. What they were seeing in Jesus was what they wanted to see. They, they were looking at him through a false lens. They were looking for a conqueror. They wanted someone to come and overthrow the Romans. They wanted a problem solver. Sort my problems out. They wanted a nationalist. They wanted a provider. They wanted a king who would meet their agenda. They wanted him here. They wanted him now in Israel, a Messiah or king of their own making or on their own terms. And the tragedy is this is reflective of perhaps you might say the human heart. It's not unusual behavior. Quite a lot of people have their own concept of what they think God should be like. And what he should do, how he should be. Rather than the other way around, because if there's a God, doesn't it stand to reason that it's what he does, what he says? and how he goes about it that actually matters. And if you look at the Gospels, you would notice that Jesus had laid the ground about his identity and about his purpose already, but they were filtering it out. And the tragedy is this, and it is to this day, people want something inferior. They want something lesser than what God is offering. John records in the gospel, this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. And on another occasion, John 8, 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Who is the you? It's you. It's you and me. He's come. He had come for the world. He'd come for everybody. He'd come for us. But they wanted a Messiah that would tick their personal boxes. No regard for the, for the wider issue, the condition of man's heart before God, what is the biggest issue in the world? What's the biggest problem we've all got? It's being split away from God. Our relationship with him is broken. And this is what he come to fix. And only he can fix it. And only he knows how, because he is God. That's why he came. And that was why he was there. But as the masses cheered him on, he'd have known that the very same people within five days were going to betray him. They would be calling for Barabbas to be set free, a murderer to be set free instead of him. And not only that, they would cry out, crucify him. So as Jesus went into Jerusalem, what must he have felt? knowing that this was all a prelude to what was going to happen in five days' time. It makes the betrayal of Jesus even worse, doesn't it, when you consider the fickleness of people, us, you might say. We can all be fickle. Jesus knew what was coming, and his disciples didn't have a clue. Maybe they even thought, this is great. We're about to hit the big time. But the waving of palm branches were another warning sign that the people were misinterpreting what was going on. It says they took palm branches and went down to the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, 
Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Waving palm branches was a traditional symbol of victory, something you'd do to welcome a conquering leader. Can you sense what's going on? They're actually thinking, this is the one who's going to overthrow the Romans. Where's my sword? The context was wrong. There is a future occasion when Jesus will return, and it's going to be different. But this time, he'd come in peace. The proper context was that he'd come to Jerusalem for Passover to die, not to kill. And as John introduced him at the very beginning of his ministry, he said of him, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He'd come in peace. He is the Prince of Peace, and he's on his way to become the Passover lamb. Two and a quarter million sheep, that's a lot of sheep. Didn't solve the problem. One, one would, he would. The Passover lamb was coming into Jerusalem to give his life. Another giveaway sign is that Jesus rode in on a young donkey. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. This happened exactly as Zechariah had prophesied. If you look at chapter 9, verse 9, 550 odd years prior to this day, he'd been given a revelation by God that this was going to happen. But rather than seeing the Prince of Peace coming in in peace on a donkey, a beast of burden, they were looking and they saw something else. They weren't ready. Because riding on the donkey's colt was completely intentional. It was crucial to frame the proper context of his arrival. You see, when kings and their representatives visited cities in peace, they would go in on a donkey. It was a sign. It was a sign they weren't coming out to dish out punishment, vengeance, or going to war. And it would be obvious for all to see. People would know it. And if you've seen a, a, a donkey, the way they, they move, it's somewhat different to a 19 hands horse. If a king was on his way to settle matters through combat, he was on the big horse, the stallion, and it was obvious, and you'd gulp at the sight. But no, it was a cult that hadn't been ridden before, and that was important as well, because to perform a religious or a sacred duty, it was important that the donkey hadn't been ridden before. This was the first thing it was going to do, and it was of such significance. It was going to carry the load, the burden, of the one who would take the burden of our sin on himself. He was still coming as king, the promised king and savior. We read in Colossians, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Judgment was coming, but the judgment was going to be meted out on him so that it doesn't have to be on me or you. Jesus' own blood, like the, like the lambs who would have their blood shed as they were killed, the same was going to happen to him. It would be his blood shed in order that we might have peace with God. And this is the way that God reconciles us to himself. He pays the price. All of it. 
He did it for the world, for you and for me. In Philippians, we read, though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Talk about going low to save us. The penny didn't drop at this point, even for the disciples, but it would. And we can tell from the Gospels that they've been conditioned, even themselves, to thinking in a similar way to some of the people who were celebrating Jesus as a Messiah that they thought was going to overthrow the Romans. They were thinking along those lines, and Jesus had been, over time, unraveling that, reteaching them what scriptures really meant so that they would understand but even at this point, they hadn't fully grasped it. And toward the end of our reading, we're told his disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment, a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, that is when he ascended 40 days after his resurrection, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. For so many and for so long, their eyes had been closed to the truth of God's word about the Messiah, the coming King. As Jesus explained himself, recorded by Luke, you foolish people, you find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It's all about him. We're so disadvantaged speaking English. Because if we spoke Old Hebrew and we opened up the scripture, you would see the Lord is him. It is him. And the scriptures reveal him from start to finish. We've looked at this before, the appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. He did visit. A quick word on cults and false religions. If you want to understand or decide whether another uh, form of belief is true or false, just consider what the belief is in Christ. Christ is God in the flesh. And any religion or cult that does not agree with that and accept the scriptures that we've read already, there's enough here to know who he is, what he says of himself. It's a cult. It is false. But I have to say, I'm probably foolish myself in that there's so much more to know. There's so, so much more to delve and discover about Christ and his plans and his purpose. It's just so mind-blowing the more I look at it, how his purposes and plan from start to finish are being played out exactly according to his will. You might say it's a bottomless pit of truth. It's wonderful. There's so much more. And my question this morning is, well, how about you? Who are you seeing this Palm Sunday? Are, are, are any of us under a, a misunderstanding? Is there any risk that we haven't quite got it exactly as it really is? Because it's so much more. He is so much more. He is God come to save us, to save you and me. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead. And they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about his miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. The Pharisees wanted to kill Lazarus. <laughs> they wanted to kill off the evidence of what Jesus did. 
And within five days, they would kill Jesus himself. Some sincerely believe. Some are sightseers or onlookers. People, you, know, you get people who, who love to see something miraculous, but they're not really interested. Some want, want a bit of excitement, something sensational. Some want something or someone else. Some even hate him. The Pharisees hated him. And we all have a decision to make. And John lays it on the line. In John 3, we read, anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. Why would God be angry? Well, if you have both of your arms outstretched and nailed to a cross, and your arms are outstretched to everybody in order that they might have forgiveness of sins and eternal life, and someone says, no, don't want it, stuff you, I hate you, <laughs> wouldn't that make you feel angry? I'm sure there are other reasons for God to be angry, but I thought of this one. The fact that his arms were outstretched, they would be outstretched in five days' time, reconciling man to God by taking upon himself the sin, the punishment, the filth, everything that is wrong about me, everything I've done and will do, loaded on him. What a burden, just for me. Yeah, I, can, I think he's rightly angry if someone says, no, nah, not interested. That's why the writer to Hebrew, the Hebrew says, so what makes us think we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus himself and then delivered to us by those who heard him speak? There can be no excuse. He offers forgiveness, redemption, a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son, who's paid it all, who's made a way, blazed the trail, as we've said before, died, resurrected, ascended, and beckons you and me to come. You can be with him forever. And that's his offer. What's your response. I'm sure I'm talking to many converted people, but maybe there's one person in this place or listening in online and you haven't said, yes, actually, that's what I want. Your way, not my way, not my concept, but the real identity of Christ to be my savior and my God who will take the burden of my sin, who will save me, and bring me into his glorious presence, not my terms, but his. And these are they, <laughs> that we accept him, that we ask for his forgiveness, that we receive it, that he does everything, because only he can do it all, all that is necessary in order for us to have that cleansing experience of sins forgiven and eternal life with him, for which we give thanks and praise and glory. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for the links that you went to, and we remind ourselves every Sunday and probably many days, if not every day during the course of the week, those who have put our trust in you. Lord, we thank you that you know each one of us, that you love each one of us, and I just pray, Lord God, that wherever we stand at this moment, near or far, I ask, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would drive home the truth of your word, your identity, your deity, your love, the fact that you have prepared a way that we might be reconciled to yourself, forgiven, forever, cleansed, and adopted into your family. Thank you, Lord God, that it's simple, that you say all who call upon your name will be saved, that your word tells us that. And so I just pray that anybody here or 
listening in online who wishes to call, who will receive that gift from you, will just do so now. And that they would know as they call upon you to forgive them, to save them, that they would know by your Holy Spirit, as you promise, will give that assurance, that seal of sins forgiven and eternal life with you. We ask this in your wonderful name. Amen. Thank you for that this morning, Richard. Let's uh, stand if we're able as we bring our praise and worship to the one who saves us. Let's sing together. Praise is rising Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring. Hearts are yearning for you. We long for Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Give the sound of hearts returning to We turn to you in your kingdom. Broken lives are made new. You make all things new. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away, Hosanna, Hosanna, you 
Hosanna. Come have your way among us. Worthy of all our praises. Hosanna. Hosanna. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Come have your way. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, 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 Hosanna. Please be seated. 